electric, gas, wastewater collection, and water utilities. Uh, this, sort of, this is the, the arching overview of what we're thinking of bringing to you in the way of, of increases. Uh, it's your first bite at the apple. You get to come back, ask us a bunch of questions, and uh, we'll be coming back with the water and wastewater proposals on April 4th. And the electric and gas will come to you on May 16th. The uh, final adoption night will be, uh, some, I'm not quite sure what the final night is in June, um, but that night we'll have uh, any hearings also that we need to have on the water side for uh, Prop 218 related hearings. So, once again, here it's a, we review the financial reserves, the main one being the operations reserve. Uh, here we, we also talk a little bit about just uh, we have the refuse rate uh, and storm drain rate increases on our slides just as a point of, of uh, notation. Uh, tonight we're bringing to you only two rate increases and that would be for the electric and water. The gas and wastewater collection we currently are proposing no uh, rate increases at this time. Uh, the overall rate increases that we are proposing uh, for the overall bill impact is going to be lower than what we showed last year. So uh, to start, um, as I said, we're talking about a lot about reserve health here. And uh, back in 2015, we had uh, only one real reserve, and that was the rate stabilization reserve for each one of the funds. Um, but it, was a, it covered everything, and the minimum and maximum guidelines for the amount of money we needed or wanted to hold in it were a little bit squishy. So at the recommendation of the auditor, we went and firmed these up. We broke out the amount of money into different reserves for different purposes and, and tied in and uh, firmed up those minimum max, min and max guidelines. So the main one that we have now is the operating res operations reserve. Uh, and this one is uh, meant to um, hold our our day-to-day uh, cash that we need to, to go on. We also still have the rate stabilization reserve, but this is sort of a holdover. It's, it's excess money that we're using up to, uh, to help keep rates low. Um, we also have uh, additional reserves for uh, construction capital improvement projects um, and committed and reappropriated funds from prior projects as well. Can I ask a question? Sure. Sorry, I don't too much, but there's some discussion later on of distributions operation reserve. Yes. So in some of our funds, uh, the electric and gas, um, we had primarily in the electric these days. There's uh, back in, remember the, the old days, deregulation? Um, we, we were required to break out the funds into two separate groups, the, the commodity side, the supply side. It was possible for people to uh, procure their resources from external suppliers, whereas the distribution side is what we here in Palo Alto need in order to transmit energy or gas services to customers. We still have the electric supply, uh, the electric fund broken out into the supply and distribution uh, funds in case anything ever happens again. But it's it's easier to have keep them broken out than to bring them all back again. And then, of course, someone's going to turn around and bring back deregulation or something like that, and we'll have to split them. So. We have an operations reserve for the distribution and the supply side in most cases. Okay. So um, as, I, as I mentioned, the operations reserve is our primary uh, reserve. We usually try to keep between 60 to 120 days worth of, op of expenses in there. We generally try to target about the 90, in the, right in the middle, 90. Um, there's an additional component to this that we talk about. It's the risk assessment level, and that's uh, sort of the sum of all fears bit. That's uh, if we had a max, the maximum amount of revenue variance that we've seen in the last 10 years. Uh, say if we've, you know, the biggest we've ever seen is a 10% uh, revenue drop, um, sales drop. We factor that in there. We also look at uh, the cost of if we had a 10% increase in, in CIP expenditures for some reason we needed to go out and, and do a new project. So that's factored into those risk assessment lines. We have additional reserves as well, as I mentioned, the rate stabilization, uh, unassigned. When we don't, uh, when reserves get to max, we put them into unassigned to be used as soon as possible, and CIP reserves for any excess capital project funds. So the slide, the, big, the main slide we go for tonight is the, the overall rate projection. 
as I said, uh, in the electric utility, electric utility, we're looking at a 12% rate increase. Um, now, these are preliminary projections, really, for the uh, for the electric side. Chances are we're, we've been looking at it. I'll, I'll say this early. On the electric side, we've uh, once we did the rate increase back in July, we've noticed that revenues sales have been down by about six to seven percent. So we're actually going to need probably something closer to about a 14% rate increase on the electric side. Even with that said, we're looking at still having bill, overall bill changes of about, four, you know, about 5%. Um, gas, wastewater, no rate increase. Uh, water, 4%. Uh, refuse is going to project to be a 5. Storm drain we have in there just for points of comparison. But in general, the overarching uh, long-term view is about 4 to 5% rate increases going forward. And the medium residential bill run these days runs about two hundred eighty-three dollars. Medium, medium, for a single family single family residential home. How does it compare against like PG&E? So our electric rates are very favorable. We're like thirty-five percent below um, PG&E. Have a rate increase. Over the over our, of others, we don't have uh, a sense yet of what other utilities are doing with regards to their rate increases at this point in time. Um, we sort of go a little bit earlier than, than some. Um, part of that is we, we have to start earlier for specifically the water and wastewater side. Those are Prop 218 uh, related items and we need to have a 45 day notice sent out before we have the council hearing. So we need to get this rolling relatively early in the year. Uh, going out, so I don't. Uh, other agencies, they sometimes don't even do their rate increases until, say, if they do July, they're now going to their boards and starting to put out notices. Or some of them don't even start their rating, their rate changes until, say, September. So, so Eric, along those lines, do you recall when we would be issuing our Prop 218 notices for rate increases? So. Here, what we would do is, as I said, in April 4th, we'll bring you the water and wastewater uh, proposed rate changes. If those, if you approve those at that point in time, by the end of April, we will send out the Prop 218 notices. And then uh, that would be done 45 days ahead of whatever June hearing that we end up having the utilities rate night. Refuse too, right? And refuse. Thank you. So. And this, so this year, the only items covered under the Prop 218 notice would be the water and refuse items. So. And as I mentioned, you know, four to five percent rate increases in the in going forward in the future. Last year, we were thinking that we would need something a bit steeper, say on the order of about nine percent overall rate increase. So, even with all this said, even though we had need have a higher electric rate proposal than what we were thinking, the overall bill impact is going to be less than what we were thinking we were going to be last year. And with that, I'm moving to the individual funds. If anybody has any questions before I launch in. Oh, okay. Moving on. Given the small nature of this group, I think, I mean, if it's okay with the, okay. the other side, jump in and, yeah, right. right. When, when, this, when the group, the presentation is finished, we'll have a round of sort of comments and questions. And I guess we're not going to do any motions tonight. So. Okay, moving in. So, um, so uh, what kind of feedback have you heard from residents in terms of the bills and increases and stuff like that? Have you got any feedback? In general, our feedback is, you know, people are fairly used to the fact that we've had, you know, we've had rate increases pretty much every year, especially yeah. in the last few years with regards to uh, needing to increase water rates and wastewater rates related to the drought. Yeah. Um, people understand that, the, you know, folks are generally understanding that you know, these increases are necessary. So, and when we had the, while the, well, moving into the electric, uh, the last time that we had an electric rate increase was July 2009. So there had been quite a, quite a period of gap. Uh, before we had our uh, most recent electric rate increase. We didn't hear a whole lot in the way of complaint um, from customers when we did that. I mean, most of what you hear these days are questions as to when we're going to end the drought surcharge on water, which I will tell you tonight we're proposing to uh, remove that July 1st. So I think that'll, 
that'll make a lot of people happy on that side. Yeah, the reason why I'm asking is, um, you know, back when I was running for election, I knocked on a lot of doors, and one of the things that came up was this thing about the water, right? They say, hey, I'm using less water, but I'm getting charged more. So that seemed to be a very frequently, because I always ask people, what are you, you know, what are you concerned about? And people say, well, the water rates. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was also increasing, interested in knowing how it's increased versus PG&E, right? Maybe everyone's increased, right? It's just the way it is, or maybe just us, but um, so we might need to do some marketing around there because it seemed like um, even though this is a really dry subject, some people really care about it. Agreed. And, and are not happy with increase. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Well, I'm not sure what you found when you were knocking doors. I mean, yes, I heard the same thing about water. The other thing I heard about, and I don't know how much flexibility we have here, is from elderly, you know, fixed rate pays, pairs, right? Um, I don't know if we can differentiate those, those customers. There, there was a lot of confusion on this topic last year and a lot of discussion about communication and so forth. Um, I, guess, I guess what we're hearing is people, are st people still remember it, remembered it as of last October too. Right? So you're saying that the drought surcharge is going to go away and so forth? So, come. so on that note, I'll talk a little bit more uh, when we come back in April, I'll talk a little bit more about where our proposed communications plan is going to be. I'll get some feedback from our communications manager on that. So launching into electric, um, here's a case where, as I said, we had a rate increase last year, um, and we had projected that we were going to need an additional rate increase this year, uh, about 9 to 10 percent. Um, we knew that the operations reserves were going to be below or, or at minimum when we do, did that proposal. But as I also said, the uh, sales have been coming in lower than was expected. So the, we were expecting to see a steeper revenue line. It's, it's coming in less, uh, and expenses have not. Expenses have been a little bit lower now that we've had. You know, we're starting to get some rain. So we will in the future. Uh, we should see uh, less in the way of purchase costs. We get a lot of our energy via hydro projects, and hydro is by far the cheapest resource. But um, you know, those rains are relatively recent, and we won't see those cost savings until later on down the line. Okay. So, so quick question: It seems like you know the next two years, next two fiscal years, we have about a ten percent increase each year, and after that, it's one to three percent. Are we? paying into the operations reserve more now, or why is it kind of front-loaded? Well, so as it, you can see here in the reserve transfers, we've got, um, we're pulling out about 11.4 million from the hydro stabilization reserve, pulling out essentially everything that's left in the supply rate stabilization reserve. We're paying, we're using what reserves we have just to get, to, to get through and keep the operations reserve as flush as possible. And we're also going to propose pulling in about $10 million from the electric special projects reserve to keep the operations reserves um, healthy. Now, normally, the special projects reserve is just that. It's for special projects. We have that set aside for um, things such as building a secondary transmission line, smart grid projects, and whatnot. And it's not really meant to be used as a rate stabilization mechanism. If we use it, we will plan on paying that money back to it over the next couple of years, say FY20 and FY21, to reseed it for those future projects. And that paying down the electric special projects reserve would come from these same rate increases just further down the road? And just further down the road. After we've increased rates, we would then pay it back. So, so, uh, so what's, what's the rate of inflation right now? We're estimating a rate of inflation about 25 to 3%, I think, in our, in our models. No, no, I'm asking the rate of inflation. What is like, because I think the rate of inflation right now is pretty, pretty low, right? I mean, if, if you look at the... Yeah, right. No, no, mm -hmm. well, a couple C of percent, okay. CPI mm -hmm. is like three and a half. Three and a half, yeah. Okay. Um, so 12 percent is, is what, th uh, four times the rate of inflation? Is that the way you think about it? You did. Is that, is that right? Okay. So um, I guess, you know, the naive resident would probably ask, so why is incre the rate increasing more than 4x or 3x the rate of, of inflation of the Bay Area? And what would your answer be? Well, actually, I could go right okay. here to this graph <laughs> and go to the chart. Um, and the reason is you can see, and you'll see this chart shows up, uh, the same format of the chart shows up across all of the utilities. The blue line up at the top is our revenue stream, and the bars show our expenses. 
and in electric, revenues have been and are projected to be below expenses. And um, so, so why we we went through a whole string there of no rate increases, even when expenses were above, um, and we were, as we said, bleeding off the the rate stabilization reserves to bring them down. We, at the time that we did our study in 2015, we determined then that we had quite a bit of excess money that we, that we were holding on. If it's the customer's money that we'd collected over years. So instead of doing rate increases, we said we'll hold things flat and, and use those rate stabilization reserves and then start increasing slowly as, as we start dwindling those down. And then the drought happened. <clears throat> um, Unfortunately, with the drought, that meant that we didn't get the hydro. We had to go out for more market purchases. Uh, and we've seen our what reserves, we've gone through them much faster than what we were originally uh, expecting to use them at. So that's why we need to increase rates faster than a rate of inflation. Uh, we, the goal here is to bring rates up to a case to where we're, you always want to have revenues matching expenses. And that's what this proposal um, gets us to. So, yeah. So, yes. A question about that. So, so that was sort of what it looked at. And if I mm -hmm. recall right, there was a little bit of discussion on this last year, and we basically burned down the rate stabilization reserve in order to cover mm -hmm. this. But did we reduce the operations reserve as well? to subsidize rates? Because it looks like the operations reserve was at the, at the bare minimum in 2015, mm -hmm. right? And, and even that has dropped a little bit. So, yeah, we, so did some of the stabilization come out of the ops reserve? Yes. I mean, we've had to use a little bit from everywhere to, to get through this, this wonderfully tough time. So okay. um, I can, yes. Um, so, um, and I don't know if this is a comment, but do you guys hedge your bets? I mean, is there like futures goodbye to hedge so you could use um, like energy futures or options to kind of hedge so that you don't, you don't have this kind of fluctuation? Uh, generally, we have long-term contracts in relation to our, for our uh, electric and, and say gas portfolios, but we don't, I, I'm not quite sure on the hedges, no, not so much. No. Is, is it common among other utilities or not really? I, not my, my realm to, to speak. I, I can ask the, the relevant power procurement people and get back to you in two weeks when we return or get back to you on that one so we, we, yeah we do have long-term renewable contracts um, so those but, and those yeah. typically provide the best rates it's the mm -hmm. long term we mm -hmm. let's see what is it the long term year beyond um, month ahead mm -hmm. day ahead and spot market so clearly the shorter term has the higher rate but we use it as a way of balancing our load versus mm -hmm. our supply yeah well I guess what more is what I'm trying to say is I mean Virtually every industry does it, right? Like airlines, right? When price of fuel is low, you buy a bunch of futures, right? And when, when, when like, so when the prices are high, you can use the money to hedge it, right? And so right. we use the market to help defray some of the risk, right, in this. Um, so, yeah, I was just wondering. So I would, I would observe, and, and others who have been here longer can uh, correct me, but my sense is that our purchases, our decisions on how and where to make those long-term investments have been driven more by a c conservation uh, interest, such as uh, renewables via the hydroelectric, the solar projects, and the like, and have bid those out to get the best price within those uh, particular uh, categories of supply as the primary way of uh, maximizing our, our uh, market advantage. Uh, and we actually do sell some uh, power uh, periodically depending on how our load compares uh, to our supply. We used to go out <clears throat> much longer in our agreements, uh, but through council direction uh, that changed. We are more buying what I would call more on the at the market uh, as a result of that direction but it, it used to be a practice that we would go fill out two three years out um, especially in gas it got to be very um, challenging uh, the council was not very thrilled that the, the market got turned around and it was upside down for us and we were in longer well, I know that, that's what I'm saying it's like so that you could it's one thing to have like a lock, lock in a long-term contract. Right. It's another thing to 
basically use derivatives to hedge, right, to hedge the market fluctuations. So when we see the market going to a normal low, then we say, okay, let's let's put some, buy some futures or options on this so that we, you know, we don't we don't have we don't pass you know 10, 10 12 percent rate increase onto our residents, right? right? Yeah, and I guess you know it's it's a philosophical uh, policy direction that's been it's gone in the years that I've been here. It's gone both ways. Where we've gone to that, and it's oh, to not, actually, not necessarily to uh, hedging, or uh, but something close to it. Um, it. It's called laddering your portfolio, right? And you ladder out further out, and uh, it, it just being in a political public place. There's a lot more sensitivity when it goes up the the opposite way, right? When you do those. The, take those no, but, but what I'm saying, this actually moderates the risk. It doesn't. It, it doesn't increase it. It moderates it. Right? Well, that, some people would disagree with <laughs> with that because they've said if if you're if you're That's speculating the and the, and, you, and you're wrong mm -hmm. on that speculation, because then you have to buy an offset to to to, to no, it's, counter. It's different than like if you're like an energy trader, right? And you don't actually use the power, but Paul right. actually uses the power, right? So, okay, if we were if we were a speculator, we would. I, I agree there's a lot of risk there, right? Because we're not end users of the power or yeah. water or whatever, yeah. right? Um, but if we are are the consumer of this stuff, we actually use it, we can use it to moderate these fluctuations. And so that there's never going to be a time when we have like a 10, 12% increase, right? Um, so, of course, it's not free. We have to pay. It's going to cost us a bit. But it prevents like these wild swings, right? Because as Adrian said, there's some people here who are on fixed income. And, you know, 10%, 12% may not sound lot, sound locked to someone's to someone's electric bill, but and I've you know I've I've talked to some people in Palo Alto who are really like dirt poor. Mm -hmm. I mean they're they're barely they're here by the skin of their teeth, and they're not going to like seeing you know a 12% on top of a 10% mm -hmm. rate increase, right? And so I think like I w I mean to me it seems like it would behoove us to look at these financial instruments that are readily available to moderate our uh, moderate the fluctuations and take advantage of. Because we, we are a consumer of this stuff, right? So we, I mean, farmers do it, airlines do it. I mean, just about every industry f uses uses derivatives to moderate the risk. And we're not speculators, so we're not like Enron energy traders, right? But, um, anyways, let me let me let me weigh in on comment on that one a little. I think I think as Lalo said, you know, I think the pendulum has probably gone back and forth a few times with different councils and so forth. I mean, the the reciprocal argument is. You know, the market is what it is, okay? And no amount of moving things, because when you, when you do what you're talking about, you're basically moving things across time periods, okay? And, you know, you're dampening the fluctuations, but the, the long-term averages are going to end up the same either way, and if anything, you pay a slight premium for the risk reduction by all these instruments and so forth. And so the argument on the other side, which has gone back and forth, right, is that, market is what it is, okay? And uh, there's, I mean, it's simpler and more transparent if you just pass it through to the, pass it through to the customers, because that's the real cost, right? And then so, you're, now you're looking at a philosophical, you know, a philosophical dialogue, right? And it's a taste great, less filling thing, right? And so it's gone back and forth. And it could go back and forth again? The, Previous, the, the most recent councils have weighed in on the other side, but, but it could Introduce uh, Dave Yoon, our administrative officer from the utilities department. Hi. I think the main reason that caused these spikes coming up to 10 to 12 percent is because of the drought mainly, and also because there's a decrease in load or usage because of the water drought, same conservation. So I think that was the main factor. I think in general, we do try to stabilize the rates on five-year forecast, but these are some things that were out of our control. But as, you, but as you say, you can do that small signal, right? But if you have an extended drought and you run out of your ability, then suddenly you have a bigger step than you would have had maybe if you if you if you let it fluctuate. So hard hard to tell. Exactly, and Eric, you might yeah. want to move to the next yeah. slide. Yeah, yeah. Hind hindsight exactly. being twenty twenty, we would have done started years ago and started doing small increases over you know two to two percent increases over time to get us to where we you know so we wouldn't have had the double digit spikes. That's um, it. We do have our, our primary mechanism, which does exist on the next slide, which yes. is our rate stabilization reserve. So we do yes. draw down on it. Um, it does, it's certainly not an infinite resource, but it's a way of 
dampening the fluctuations on a year-to-year -year basis. And you can see the, the effects of the drawdowns here. We are taking uh, what we had in hydro uh, stabilization reserves and supply rate stabilization reserves and using them all up essentially by almost by the end of this year. Um, you can also see we're taking some money out of the special projects reserve to help stabilize a bit. So. Um, Even with all of these transfers and bringing things in, it is projected that the supply operations reserve will be below minimum, at least for the next two years or so. Um, but as is within our guidelines, the goal is we, over the forecast period, we want to bring the reserves back up to the target level. So also this, you know, to a certain extent, this also feeds the, the rate increase projections that we do. I mean, we, yeah, so we are, we are going to try and re resupply. Exactly. Mm -hmm. right. But I think the distinction here is you're talking about the operations reserve as opposed to a rate stabilization. Reserve. Yes. Yes. So this is the you know we cover fluctuations in expenditures, not necessarily trying to hold. You know, yeah. Yeah, we, 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 yeah, that's correct. We've, take, we've essentially taken all the money that we would use to try and, and buffer you know against rate increases, and we've used that up. So, so. Uh, as to supply reserve adequacy, uh, we also, uh, specific to the electric supply side, it, we also have a risk assessment here, and that's uh, that's really, uh, this one has a little bit more to it in that we look at uh, things like uh, risk to hydro type effects and, and additional purchase costs. So it's, it's a bit on the higher side than all the other ones, which are mainly distribution related. Um, but here you can see we're, we're about equal the operations reserve is a little bit below the risk assessment level but not terribly much so and again another reason why we want to try and bring that operations reserve up uh, to to mitigate against future risks on the distribution side um, we don't really have any rate stabilization reserves left those were all used up uh, FY15 um, we do have the operations reserve. We're growing it somewhat. In FY18, it's growing a touch. In FY19, uh, it's a function of how the model works. When it took in money from the special projects reserve, it, it moved it automatically to capital reserve, but that should be in uh, the distribution side. But you can see we're uh, restocking and bringing the distribution operations reserve back up. Um, so we're trying to get that. We want to keep the operations, distribution operations reserve in this case above the risk assessment level, which is sort of our, our, our bottom line. We don't want to ever really drop below that. Uh, if that were to happen, of course, we would uh, have to have a plan tell you how we're, how we're going to get above that um, as is per our guidelines. So silly question. Um, how often can we reset rates? Is it once annually? Or is, can you do it? Well? You know, <laughs> in general, we only like, we like to do rate increases, you know, once a year in July um, and have it that way, but we can and have brought forth uh, mid-year rate increases. Okay. Uh, that was gas back in 2000, 2001. Yes, I think we had uh, three or four rate increases within the span of a, a year. Okay. Um, yeah. And so. that may be because we're hitting that risk assessment level or another reason. Yeah. Okay. The, 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 gas, the gas, well, the gas actually was specific to uh, we, we had a hard cap. We do have a cap on uh, how much we can charge for commodity prices, and gas prices went way above that cap. And so we needed to go and increase rates in order just to keep afloat. So I remember those days. That's when I first was, came on. Um, so even with all this said, um, current projections are a little bit higher than what we were thinking last year. Uh, we were thinking about a 10% rate increase. We're, we're bumping it up to about a 12. Um, and we just realistically think that we're going to need a slightly larger increases going forward just to, to resupply and restock the reserves. Question. So. What is the average bill in Palo Alto? Do you know? Um, the median bill, I think, is about 283, 283. for a single-family residential home. Per month, right? Yes. Okay. So. For a family, then, what is 12% of that? So, so an additional what, 30 20, yeah, about an additional $30. So times 12, so about $360 well, a year. It's 12% it's 
so that's that's on the ten percent. Twelve percent is on the uh, the over the the total bill, but our total bill impact is only looking to be about five percent. So five percent. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. It's twelve percent on just electric portion, and I can't remember. So one hundred seventy dollars hmm? increase, basically. Hmm? One hundred seventy dollar increase for you annually. annually. Yes. Okay. Seems. So because this is a presentation from back in February, some of these slides are still uh, holdovers from back in the time before we had rain. Uh, how long will the drought last? Ideally, it is over. Um, but never say never. There's always potential of things could happen. Warm rains could come and, and wipe out the snowpack. Um, so let's hope not. Um, things like second transmission line cost with smart grid. Again, these are projects that we uh, have slated to be, if, if we do them, the electric special projects reserve would cover those. But if it turns out that we're not going to do a second transmission line, maybe reevaluate what, what, uh, what to use the uh, special projects reserve for. Um, and just general uncertainties, increasing CIP costs, something that we've seen happening to uh, the utilities in general uh, after the recession is that uh, everyone's working on infrastructure and construction crews can sort of take their, their pick of what they want to work on. Costs are going up. We've seen this happen across the board. Um, and it actually directly impacts our, um, our water, gas, and wastewater collection funds, which you'll see coming up. <laughs> is there actually enough money in the Special Reserve to do the second transmission line? I believe we're holding, a, we're currently sitting at about what, if provided that we do the 10 million transfer, we've got about a $41 million out there. So I can't remember offhand what the projected cost was on the second transmission line, but I could look that up and get back to you on that. Yeah, it was about, yeah. yeah I remember 30 to 50, 50. Yeah. the range. So but that study was also done several years ago, so we'll see what, you know, what current, current specs would come back. And with that, actually, I'm, I'm done talking about electric and was going to move on to gas. So you want to take more questions about electric or you want to, to Just one little interesting thing. Where would the second transmission line be? So the second transmission line would come down from the 280 side into uh, like through Slack uh, and uh, okay. the new accelerator territory in Stanford. So um, I don't, I haven't been involved with the discussions recently, but there was some interest by Stanford to do a joint project. Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> so the cost would be somewhat split at some. And in fact, that's. That is still the current state of the discussion. Stanford is currently uh, considering whether it is cost effective for them to participate in the project. Okay, barring other questions, moving on to gas. Less pain on the gas side. Um, no rate increase uh, f projected for um, on the distribution costs for the gas side. Now, one of the things that um, as a preface for a gas, when we talk about rate increases on the gas side, there are several factors which we uh, pass through to customers. The commodity cost changes monthly, and we pass those through directly. It changes every month on the bill. There's a, a spot on the website where we show what those costs are. Uh, PG&E transportation rates, uh, those are tied directly to uh, a pg e rate schedule, which we are charged to transport the gas on their system to Palo Alto. We pass that through uh, directly to customers. So when we talk about rate increases here, it, it's really the distribution-related costs, what we use take to operate our, our mains in infrastructure here. Um, so for that, on that side, no projected rate increases for FY18, and ongoing about 2, two to 3% rate increases in the, in the ongoing future. So here you can see that uh, revenues are a little bit closer to um, projected expenses. So that's a, a, a nicer portrait than we, we saw in the electric. One of the things you might notice is that uh, the orange bar, which is the capital investment line for FY17 and 18, um, lower than what you would see uh, going forward or in other years. A couple different reasons for this. Again, CIP projects gone out to bid 
have come back at higher projected costs than what we were expecting and what was you know budgeted for. So in order to do that, either we go and ask for more money or we repackage, redesign those projects to, uh, in, to get them done within the same budgetary constraint. That said, we're uh, currently understaffed on the gas side. And we, um, people are working, people work on the gas, water, and wastewater design area uh, collectively, so there's a lot of work to be done uh, and not enough staff to support all that. We have gas operation staff that we're uh, understaffed with. Um, and we have a large existing project which is being, uh, was done in 2016 and still wrapping that up. But the main replacement project which was originally spec'd for FY 2017 and we generally try to do a main replacement project every single year. Uh, in, in just in reality, because it came back, because we're going to have to redesign it, we said, you know, we're not going to be able to start a new project until a new redesign, get a new one going until FY19. So we've got a two-year bit of a reprieve for main replacement project work, uh, and that dropped our expenses significantly and, and is, is enabling us to have a much lower long-term rate profile going forward. As you see, if things resume back in 2019, but by then, with the rate increases that we have projected, we should be able to, to better match and get things closer. Could I so, all these. Sort of like on, on all these areas, there was a, a, a CIP dip in 27 and 18. There's a two-year yes. There's a two-year blip, 17 and 18 yeah. in water, gas, and wastewater collections. We're having a, a two-year. And is it the identical dynamic in all those? It's an identical right? dynamic. There's also um, the uh, it's the Calaf project is is taking it's taking a bit more time and, and work and, and redesigning of, of those, getting everything the existing projects that we have in the hopper uh, able and ready to run. So. Also, just to add to that is that uh, there's plans in the hopper right now to look at the downtown um, area here of University and um, uh, Linton in the um, piece to look at doing a water and gas joint trench down University that will be coming up here um, during that period of time. So we're kind of doing the design for that, um, as well as a water upgrade and a gas upgrade in the outline street lines. Uh, but it's all going to be in the downtown area. So. It's working with the other departments to see what we can do with the university from tra um, traffic and planning as well as public works. Now for a bid for the water and wastewater um, CIP projects, the bids came in about 30% higher than what we anticipated. So we had to go back and rebid twice, sometimes three times, to get it within our budget. So that's why it caused some of the delays. The bid prices have gone up because of material mainly and also because of labor. Thank you. So. The gas supply car, the, the blue bar, which is the gas supply that, as I said, we, we pass through directly, so, so revenues fluctuate one-to-one -one whenever uh, those are projected to change. Um, and we, we have estimates of what uh, the gas supply costs are doing, but they, they change even the projections that we ran about a month ago are now totally different from what we're getting today because gas market prices have been coming in low. Um, so. You know, those just fluctuate constantly. And when we talk about rate increases, what we do is we hold the commodity steady so that because if we project the rate that costs are going to, that commodity costs are going to go down, then that we'd see these wild swings and dips and it, the, the path of rate change um, becomes a bit almost nonsensical. But, um, and operations costs in here on the gas utility, we do have a little bit of a bump. You see in FY18, um, we do have a continuing um, project to do scoping to um, uh, for gas cross bores, making sure that those are uh, there's none of those in the system. So we do bear some additional cost on that. And I think that gets there. Uh, and as I said, because we've had the last year year before, we were expecting that we would go through our rate stabilization reserves fairly quickly and, and then start on a path of rate increases. Because we have a budgeting hiatus, um, we're going to have rate stabilization reserves uh, going probably into FY20, FY21, even in 22. 
and so we can keep that steadier state of rate increases going forward, which is, I think, easier for, for customers to, to deal with as well. And then do we start refilling them in 21, 22 or so? So we don't refill the rate stabilization reserves. That, that, the plan on those is that they go away. The only time that we have money in them is if we were to um, have, it, it'd even to go if we had surplus in the operations reserve more, say if some windfall situation happened and we had tons of money, that would flow back either into the unassigned or rate stabilization reserves for future use. In general, it would go to the, the unassigned with the, uh, the goal that we would try to return that to customers in some way, shape, and fashion as soon as possible. Um, or we could, or under council direction, move it to rate stabilization for a longer term use. You know, so. I'm sure like for here it looks like in, you know, 17 we've got, I don't know, six, eight million there. Mm -hmm. um, where did that come from, actually? So those were holdovers from when we when we restructured. Okay. We had large rate stabilization reserves. We took we actually took and split out uh, from the rate stabilization reserve what we felt was uh, we brought the operations reserve out and we we moved out its section back to target and then what was left over was put in the rate stabilization. So we're just slowly using that up. Okay. So the operations reserve is projected to be on target. Hooray. And a much better uh, plan than what we had uh, projected last year. We were thinking uh, nine, eight to 9% rate increases. Uh, and so we don't need to do anything near that drastic this time around. And to the point of, uh, on the gas side, our residential uh, gas bills are fairly comparable to PG&E, so surrounding territories. So. Can you tell me what are the rates like? I mean, how do we compare to each of them, like water, gas, electric? So on the electric side uh, to PG&E, we're, like I said, about 35% below. For gas, we're roughly, because they pass through gas commodities same way that we do, uh, we're about the same, maybe slightly lower. Uh, they do have some additional um, costs because of the whole San Bruno incident that they're, they're having to collect on. We also have to bear a portion of those costs through our transportation rates, but they by far, um, uh, regular customers saw um, the majority of those increases. The <laughs> um, for wastewater, we're roughly comparable to other utilities uh, agencies. And so when it comes to water and wastewater, that's a little bit more complex because there's no real, uh, for water, you have California Water Service, which is your uh, the main IOU player. But even there, they have different rates uh, in different districts and agencies. So uh, say the, the Menlo Atherton area is one district, uh, Los Altos is another district, and it, there's, dozens of agencies around us uh, to compare against. Um, and when, same for wastewater. On wastewater, we're right about in the middle of everyone. On water, we are higher than pretty much all the other agencies around. We so. will, though, as a part of the run-up to the budget, be providing tabulation of yes. comparison of rates among comparable mm -hmm. neighboring agencies. A question on that, follow-up on Councilmember Tanaka's question, which is on water specifically, you say we're generally higher, right? Does that apply to other cities that are part of the SFPUC system or just to Santa Clara County, for example? Our water rates tend to be higher because we have a much more aggressive infrastructure program than some of the other agencies around. So we all get passed through the same uh, water commodity cost, but our distribution costs are higher uh, than, than some of the other folks around. So Can you tell us how much higher? Uh, not off the top of my head, but actually in, in two weeks I have the, I'll have be bringing you the chart in, in the water report. We'll actually show you a comparison to all the local agencies. And then in terms of that infrastructure and distribution, why are we so much higher? I mean, what, what's, what's the, the physical difference that we're doing here? I don't, I don't think it's a physical difference. I think it's just that we're just being more aggressive in the replacement of, of the water mains and also the distribution portion of it. Um, you know, we... Um, Size-wise, we're pretty comparable size-wise. Um, we're not using a different type of material size-wise pipes or anything, but the thing is that, um, as Eric said, you know, we try to do a project every year um, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 15 to 20,000 feet 
um, that we're replacing. So we're pretty aggressive with the infrastructure replacement, and that's where the capitalization of using those funds come from. I think to add to Dean's comments, um, we also have uh, substantial debt for a water reservoir from a few years ago. That uh, water reservoir, a tank on El Camino Park that we built. So there's debt uh, in, embedded into the rates as well. So on the gas side, um, potential costs not included, uh, policies related to fuel switching in the long run, we're still uh, discussing and evaluating what that would mean. Probably uh, the more near term and then closer uh, of relevance to us would be any changes to the cap and trade program related to allowances. Um, post-2020, the uh, Air Resources Board is still debating as to what they want to do re with relation to that. Um, so. If we end up having to buy most or all of the allowances that we need to to offset, that could increase costs dramatically. But we're hoping that we'll still that we'll still get some measure of uh, free allowances from from the state. So, and actually, that ends gas. If, if any questions, I'll move on to wastewater. I have a mm, sure. So, because I, I I seen some of your comments earlier about. You know, there's a lot of these uncertainties that cause fluctuations, right? And the gas fluctuates, and we just pass it on. Mm -hmm. um, have you done a survey of, among other utilities um, about monitoring this with derivatives? So on the gas I'm side, I'm surprised yeah. that nobody does it because I would, it yeah. just, to me it seems like a no-brainer given given that we we have certain usage, right? And we have fluctuating demand. It's almost like a ideal case for derivatives? Gas is actually one of those cases where we used to, at one point in time, have long-term contracts, and we specifically stopped doing that. We had a three-year laddering well, strategy. I guess yeah. but I want to separate yeah. long-term contracts from derivatives, mm -hmm. because those are separate things, right? There's separate financial instruments you could use to help moderate, right? Or if, like, if prices are low, lock it in, right? There's a lot of different things you could do. And I guess I'm just kind of surprised that we're not doing that. Our gas, I mean, in the so grand, I'm just curious to know what, what do other people do, right? Because there's not a whole lot of other people out there. I mean, when it comes PG to gas, &E. well, PG&E is a is a holy, is is a huge utility, but when it comes to other utilities our size, um, it would be us, and then there's only Long Beach, I think, and Susanville are the only other gas utilities in California. And in in the grand scheme of things, yeah. we're a very small fish in the in the pond. Um, sure. So I'm not quite sure what. You know what our position would be with regards to derivatives. Again, I I will talk with our uh, gas portfolio manager and. and, and well, I'm not and just my guess, but in general, just because it seems like we we have, you know, the city is going to be using a certain amount of water, a certain amount of gas, a certain amount of electricity. It's not like we're going to tomorrow, not use any, right? We don't know. Like we we have you have pretty steady charts of what the usage is going to be, right? So, and then on the other side, you have the supply fluctuates, right? And and this is almost like this is like the textbook case of we use derivatives. And, I'm, and so I'm really surprised that we don't do anything here. I mean, this is, it doesn't get any better than that. I was just commenting to Lalo that I believe this may be addressed uh, through our risk management policy. So we'll do a little research as to how, um, whether it be specifically the use of derivatives or other um, practices uh, have factored in. Because, I, I, again, I know many of these policies have been established over many years. I, if I understand the question right, it's is there precedent in other utility, other gas utilities for using hedging instruments like derivatives as opposed to using stabilization reserves, for example, which, you know, in theory addresses the same problem. You're carrying a cost of maintaining the, the surplus in exchange for it. For the wastewater collection utility, again, uh, no rate increase proposed in FY18. Um, same reasons as in, in gas, the, the deferral of CIP. Um, nicer case here, where you know we've we've had a string of increases uh, for several years, so, it's, so people are fairly used to it. It's also the smallest utility that we have, so currently uh, looking about thirty-two dollars a month, I believe, is the charge. Um, but uh, we look at uh, no rate increase this year, and then seven percent rate increases going forward. One of the things that um, 
sometimes is, is can cause a bit of confusion for uh, wastewater is that there's two parts. There's the treatment, and there's treatment is the plant that's out by the Balins. It actually services not only Palo Alto, but but other agencies, surrounding agencies as well, so Mountain View and, and Stanford, et cetera. Hmm? They, they pay us for this? They pay, they pay yes, they pay into us. We, we use about 35% or so of, of plant, so that's the portion of that, that's the cost here that you see in blue. Of that, there's the, uh, the light blue is the operations related costs, and the dark blue is the uh, capital expense specifically related to uh, capital at, at the plant. And how do we figure out how much you charge them? Uh, it's based on flows, if I'm not, it's contractual flows, so flow and, flow and strength, yes. No, but I'm talking about the rate. How do, we, how do we know how much we charge them for a rate? Or we charge them where we charge ourselves, or how does it work? Our, so how much we charge the individual partners for? Yeah, I charge like Mountain View, right? Yep. All the time. Public works. So we do use the same formula for charging ourselves as we charge the other partners. So there's a total of six partners, and there's a formula that um, involves flow and three measurements of strength. And uh, it's a weighted average of those four components. So the answer basically is everyone gets to charge the same rate, even though we're administrating it. Charge the same um, rate for flow and the same rate for those strengths, yeah. Okay. Are, are you essentially asking, are we subsidizing the other cities? Well, I guess a couple of questions, right? I mean, uh, well, I'm, yeah. So, so basically, if, we, if first of all, if we have discretion, I mean, could we not make a profit at this, right? Or if everyone, if we have to charge the same rate as everyone else, then maybe we charge ourselves a higher rate, and then we charge a lower rate on other stuff, right? Or, so I'm trying to understand what is our flexibility there. So not much. Uh, so we have signed contracts with these people a long time ago for a long period of time. And they paid an initial amount that was agreed upon. And then this formula that I referred to is in these long-term agreements. How long is long? Uh, it, it is um, 2035 when some of them end and... Um, we just extended the Mountain View Los Altos one, um, and I'd have to check on that. I believe it's 2050 now. <clears throat>So you can see um, components are roughly increasing, uh, like operations costs uh, are generally increasing by about, you know, with inflation, three to you know, two to three percent per year. Uh, we do know that there's uh, the need to do a lot more capital maintenance work out at uh, the plant itself. It's an aging plant, aging facility. It needs work, and so there's uh, that bar is growing. It's probably the fastest growing one. So, yeah, sludge facilities. Uh, yes. So, yeah. <laughs> it's a fascinating tour. I'd highly recommend. And again, um, operations reserves are projected to be, you know, well within uh, the min-max guidelines. So again, we don't no real reason to have a rate increase at this time. Um, we'll be there's a little bit of rate stabilization reserve left, and we'll we'll use that up, but not much of a hit to the operations side. Uh, last year, we were thinking we might need something on the order of a 10% rate increase. Uh, just again, because of the the CIP hiatus, we it's just not necessary at this point in time. So, good news on for this side. And there's not really much more I can talk or have to say on the wastewater collection utility. Unless so you want me to, okay, I'll launch into water. Well, just a more basic question. So, do we are we breaking even on the contracts we are doing? Or are we like making money or losing money? Or don't know? So on we, the, on we the, service to other, city, other entities, like non view and other cities? Um, I believe we break, I mean, we everything we 
pass through the costs that we have directly. So whatever whatever total treatment costs are, mm -hmm. that gets divided out based on the percentage of, of total use. So but what, we don't profit. But, but let's say, for instance, um, you know, the cost of our labor skyrockets for some reason. Does that get passed on? We have we have these mega long contracts, right? So what happens? Um, it, it does get passed through Phil Volvo again. So the way it works is um, Palo Alto owns and operates the sewage treatment plant, but the long-term agreement uh, states that the operating costs are divided up according to that formula I just mentioned. They don't have a choice. Um, <clears throat> and it's not like other um, services that you can imagine, like our animal services center or something, where there's flexibility in on their side. Uh, their pipes flow to our sewage treatment plant. They really don't have any choices. Uh, it would be a huge, huge expense for them to say, well, we've decided we want to go to the San Jose sewage treatment plant instead. So <clears throat> we are really married to these people. Well, more than married to them. <laughs> uh, there are no divorces that are <laughs> at all likely. Um, <clears throat> And, but we do get the good side. The good thing is we get to pass on all the expenses to them in proportion. Uh, now, the capital expenditures are a little bit different. So I, the operating expenses are the ones that behave according to this formula. And the capital expenses are a little bit different depending on what the capital project is and who actually benefits. So <clears throat> as we get further into it, with the new council members um, will be, you know, <clears throat> needing to explain more of that to you, how the capital side works. Operating side is pretty darn straightforward. We, um, and the other thing we'll have to get into with you is the treatment plant reserve. So that's different than the reserves Eric has been talking about. There's this treatment plant fund and it has reserves, which you're not talking about tonight, but we are going to have to talk about because <clears throat> the treatment plant has got to undergo a, a major rebuild over the next um, couple of decades, and it's going to require major expenditures, and um, we've got to figure out a funding source for that, and we don't have significant reserves. It is reflected in the growing capital expenses, yes. The, the treatment capital part, yeah. Uh, part of the rebuild is in there. <clears throat> and as we've discussed with um, Ed a number of times and some of you, um, we don't have enough capital projects in those out years built in. So we're OK for the next couple of years. but. We're going to have to bite some large bullets here sooner or later. So you've said this Eric, in the past. I'm sorry, we have to stop. Okay. We've lost quorum. I was just going to ask Phil. So you you said a couple of times that sort of you had concern that you know the the, the wastewater expenses were going to capital expenses. You know there was more work than was needed to be reflected in our plans, and that's what you're talking about here. Right. For the for the next few years in this projection, um, we're um, taking out loans that are expressed here, right. and capital projects are covered by those loans. Right. But um, 
in the last few years of this projection, we really should have started more projects, but we haven't figured out a way to fund that yet, and we didn't want to show this uh, escalating unfunded uh, I see. I see. situation. But your expectation is as you work towards that, the number, the, the, the blue bars are going to grow even with, within the confines of this The chart. blue bars in those latter yeah. years, yeah. Beyond five years or so yeah. uh, that has already been years. estimated. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there are a couple of variables there, one in terms of the capital planning and, and long-term uh, financial forecasting. The other, uh, just to perhaps um, give you a preview, back to uh, Councilmember Tanaka's point, is another uh, potential revenue and or we'll see how the expense side looks is the use of recycled water coming out of the uh, water uh, treatment plant as well. So that's uh, going to be a uh, both a capital expense as well as a question in terms of the, the potential revenue associated with the effluent as it goes to tertiary treatment and beyond. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm glad Ed raised that, is that um, w there's where we do have some flexibility. We own that 35 percent of that water. And um, we don't own the other 65 percent those partners do. But the 35 percent that we own uh, could become a, a, a valuable asset. Would we, would us and all of our partners sell it together or pass it on together or would each of us take our Could happen money? either way. Uh, the, the agreements don't dictate that. Okay. Last is the water. The water fund, uh, what we are proposing is a 4% rate increase this year. Uh, the increase that we're doing this year is solely to meet, uh, bring the commodity rate up to what was projected from the SFPUC that we got from them. Um, so no distribution related increases, just merely commodity. In that case, what the, the dollar per unit increase is going to be the same really for all customers. Um, we were earlier thinking that we needed to do about a 6% rate increase, so that's a little bit lower. As I said earlier, though, the, the big, the, the best news of all, uh, we're proposing the deactivation of the drought surcharge come July. So I can, I have some tables at the back that will show you what the impact of that is. Um, again, we're looking at uh, the same situation here, but as you can see, the, the expenses are still projected to be a little bit above or right at um, where revenues are for FY17 and 18. Because of that, and just because of the magnitude that expenses are projected to be above revenues in future years, we, we didn't feel that it was um, a wise decision to, to just do no rate increase at this point in time. Felt something was needed. So 4% with a series of sixes uh, backing it up um, appeared to be a reasonable course um, with regards to uh, both, uh, you know, meeting, you know, keeping rate changes relatively flat for customers as well as, as getting our operations reserve back in, in line. Question on that. Um, is there a difference between at least the customer in terms of keeping the drought surcharge and keeping that percentage increase lower versus this? So, so keeping, well, the drought surcharge by far, so the, the reason why the drought in surcharge was put on was because during the drought, sales were dropping precipitously, and we weren't and to meet our distribution-related costs. It wasn't to deter use, actually. It's not meant to deter use. I mean, right. it might have it might have had that effect, but it's really to keep our, our the distribution operations in in okay. you know, in a float. So now that Revan, now that because we're out of the drought, customer usage just started to pick back up again. Um, we're recovering our distribution costs. We're, get, we're getting back there. There's no reason to keep this this charge okay. on on customers' bills. Sorry, you know, Thank it you. just doesn't it doesn't feel right. <laughs> well, my recollection was that part of the flap over it was that part of the confusion in the flap over it last year was, I mean, the, dr the drought label was was you know not entirely, you know. Mm. People thought, oh, yeah, it'd be easy to understand, but actually it wasn't mm -hmm. directly, yeah. directly had to do with the drought. It really yeah. had to do with drop, dropping, dropping mm -hmm. commodity usage and the amortization of the capital costs, mm -hmm. right? right. Yeah. Um, but aren't we going to a system in which people get two numbers on their bill now? They uh, so I'm mixing that with, with with one of the other services. Well, we so one of the things we're we're constantly contemplating. Yeah, well, what we're contemplating is is moving to. Um, and we do have the option 
of uh, taking the commodity charge from SFPUC and making that a pass through as well. Um, so that you would see uh, there are two line items on the bill, one with uh, the commodity charge, the SFPUC costs, and then the distribution related charge. Um, it's a little bit different on the water side than it would be, say, on, on the gas so, or, or even if an electric, if we were to do a pass-through mechanism on, on that side as well. Uh, it would have to be separately noticed via Prop 218 notice when we did it, and we would only be able to do it for five years and then have it um, and then reapproved. Uh, it's, it's a function of the, the law. It's, it's almost considered like a... a uh, almost like a CPI type increase the way that it was written in so we're not allowed to continually pass through in perpetuity whenever uh, P whenever uh, SFPUC changes their rate schedule we'd have to get it reaffirmed um, so it would still be the the negative uh, it would wouldn't be a vote process it would still be the current form where we would have to get a majority of customers saying that they would uh, they didn't want to do it in order to not do it but um, the benefit of, of doing this is that uh, since the SFPUC doesn't change their rate or doesn't approve their rate until late May, maybe sometimes even early June, right now we're working with estimates. So what we're proposing might be higher or lower than what SFPUC actually ends up doing. Now, in this case, you know, we can, you know, if we're over, we can use that to fund reserves, future rate increases come down. If we're lower than what they end up doing, Hopefully, we'll have enough from reserves to be able to to make it up, and you know, you know. But if things get really bad, then we we end up coming back at mid year, um, and we do always have that option. Something we we might contemplate doing this year, though, is if if reserves at the end of the year look healthy enough after we've had the drought surcharge um, money coming in and usage coming up, uh, we might come in at say mid year and do another Prop 218 notice and say, you know, here's the final SFPUC rate. Let's Let's we're going to tie it back, and if that ends up being, we would probably do it more so in the case of it was if it was a rate decrease for customers. Like if we ended up guessing high, then that's where we would go on that that side. But. And speaking of wholesale water rates, uh, it's a little bit difficult. You know, that they've their project they've just been going up and up and up and up again. This is uh, due to the SFPUC's. Uh, water you know, infrastructure program that they've had going on, multi-billion dollar project uh, that they're issuing bonds for constantly. And so that the cost of that keeps getting passed on uh, through us to us in our water rates. Um, now, again, they're in a similar position of, you know, those costs are relatively fixed going forth. Uh, bond payments are, are relatively flat and constant thing, but the mechanism they have to charge us is by water usage. So if water usage is going down, our rates go up. If water usage, you know, goes goes up, then potentially, provided that they also don't need to replenish their reserves, their rates could even, you know, stay flat or come down. But that's the, and in general, we don't ever project that their rates are going to come down. So it's just, yeah. Um, so right now we're looking, we're, with this path, where uh, it looks like the operations reserve is going to be relatively healthy um, through the forecast period, so we're hoping that this ends up being the case. We've got a little bit of money sitting out, um, leftover funds we're projected to have um, from rate stabilizations and, and unassigned. Uh, we have some capital reserve uh, funds that are left over. We'll use all that up, uh, and in the future years. We still take a bit of a hit to the operations reserve, but we bring everything back up to about 30 million, you know, for total reserves, about $30 million, which is right about where um, it breaks even. And again, a better forecast than what we were uh, showing last year. We were thinking 9% rate increases. Uh, so something less is always better. And Again, uh, now if one of the things that's always a, a noted point of uncertainty, after a drought, and we've seen this in the last several droughts, uh, usage recovers, but it never recovers to the level it was at when you, before you started the drought. Uh, it comes up to maybe 60% of, of where it was at before. Um, and, 
but you never know. Yeah, and nor do you really know, at, you know, how long it will take to recover. We seem to have a fairly, you know, uh, it seems to be about five five percent above our projections for this year, so we're happy, um, and that it's recovering faster. Will that stall out? Um, we don't know. Um, it's purely a function of what happens with future weather and what improvements people have made to their home systems, behaviors adopted during the drought that maintain. So there's always a little bit of uh, uncertainty out there with regards to the future, but so far things are looking pretty good. So. And same uh, uncertainties in the water that we see for the gas and wastewaters uh, with high, um, higher CIP costs. Let's quickly skip this and uh, so there we are, and I think what I'll, I'll, I'll follow up with the actually timeline for future actions. So as I said, April will be bringing the electric and gas financial plans to the UAC. Um, the water and wastewater financial plans will come to you on April 4th. Prop 218 notices will go out at the end of April. Um, and then in May, I believe, yes, May 16th, the electric and gas financial plans will come back to you. And then in June, we'll have the final council hearings and adoption of rates. And financial plans. Hey, Eric, before you move on, could I chime in on the <coughs> Please do. Two work so, um, just to, for the new council people mostly, um, so tonight you're focusing on the utility rates, but Eric has shown you the other rates that um, the Public Works Department is um, in charge of. And I just wanted to give two notes on the two that we. Um, aren't talking about tonight. One is uh, refuse. First, just again for the new council members. So utilities handles the um, <clears throat> things that people want, like water and energy. <laughs> Public Works, for some unknown reason, uh, was given the things that people don't want, the wastewater, the refuse, uh, and it used to be stormwater. That's changing. Everybody recognizes the value of stormwater now. That's great. So refuse, the only thing I wanted to um, note for you there, and again, um, that is going to come back to you on April 4th with this other package that um, the other ones that Eric mentioned for April 4th, right? And so refuse we haven't talked about tonight. There's really no surprises there. Uh, the only surprise for your new council members might be that you're being asked on April 4th to um, pass those on. Um, and <clears throat> so the only note I would say is it's uh, the 5% increase is part of a three-year plan. It's the third in a three-year plan that we had to bring the residential rates in line uh, with the commercial rates so that one group was not subsidizing the other. And it's actually less than we had envisioned that it might be. We had, our three-year plan was really to have an 8% increase this year. And because the economy is booming, and unfortunately people seem to be throwing more stuff away, the commercial side, um, we didn't have to do an 8% increase, and we could do a 5% increase. So it's sort of good news on refuse, and that's probably all that needs to be said about that. Storm drain, the thing I wanted to warn you about there, I think you're all fully aware that we're <clears throat> in this period where people are voting right now. Uh, the ballots went out April 24th. They're due back, I'm sorry, um, February 24th. They're due back April 11th, and we're going to count them on April 12th. So that'll be, we won't know on April 4th when you meet again. We won't know the results of that. So we'll have to leave this placeholder uh, information that we have there in. So you'll, you'll see that again, but you um, won't be asked by us to take any action on that um, <clears throat> because we won't have any new information on the outcome. So it, it could be that the new, um, the proposed rate is approved, in which case the picture will look like this. Or it could be that it won't be, in which case the rate would be decreased, uh, effective immediately, it would be uh, June 1, it would be decreased to the pre-existing rate, which is about a third of what the current 
uh, rate is. So I just wanted to alert you that <clears throat> you, you won't, we won't have any new information or, and you won't be making a decision uh, on that on April 4th. That's where your five percent per year total bill comes out. Of. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so, oh yeah. So that's that's this is our proposals uh, that we're going to be bringing to you about an overall bill change about four to five percent. So, that's the, you know, in the perfect world, I would uh, you know love to bring zeros, but this is yeah. I want to ask a question about the water utility line there, which we got. The next five years, we got a 4% raise in the first year and 6% raises each year after that. If I understand your curve here, okay, mm -hmm. you know, your, your blue line out here has got a constant slope mm -hmm. here, which I assume is proportional to the 6% increase every year. Mm -hmm. So it looks to me like the actual costs take a bigger than, I'm, I'm going to guess from this, they take a big step in the first year, right, and then they're almost flat after that. So what you've got here is, is basically 6% a year out here for the, for the rates, mm -hmm. but the costs actually look like 10%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, right? And so that's a policy decision to smooth that over five years as opposed to having to track the actual costs. Yes. Is that, is that an you, accurate that, statement? That is, that is a choice that we made to try and do longer smoother rate increases when possible. Uh, yeah, you're right, the alternative would be to take the water rates and jump them up, say, you know, 10, 12 percent, and then do something and then drop them down. Um, in general, we don't like to do double digit rate increases unless, like what we're having to do in the electric, unless we're in a position where we have a little, you know, not a lot of reserve room to wiggle because it's, it's not it's not good for customers to, to have that happen to them um, and and that's that's really what reserves are for is to try and cushion those blows so yes that is that is a policy call uh, on my part <laughs> to do um, the long the longer slower path so and you know as we always hope that costs will come in lower and you know maybe sales will pick up and that we can bring those future increases down even more so, so I would just correct that Eric ultimately it's the council's policy choice yeah, on correct. how those rates mm -hmm. are smooth and just want to make yes. sure everyone understands yes. that we understand that a lot. <laughs> I, make well, a, I make a proposal you can change them anyway and, and request anything you, you wish and that we it's my job to comply so yes um, so I was, I was going to finish up on this the last little bit uh, for uh, the water rate because those have been put out there um, set a 4% rate increase and these are bills without the drought surcharge um, but if for what people are actually paying now with the drought surcharge and then it's actually going to be a nice decrease for pretty much everybody so um, and the reason so, why we are seeing revenue growth is because we do have increasing consumption going forward. So, Right. So I actually think in terms of one of the first questions we asked was marketing these new rate changes, mm -hmm. this is a good story, yeah. right? And say, hey, we're taking off this 20% surcharge. But at the same time, if people have mistakenly believed this is a drought surcharge, let's let them keep on knowing they need to preserve water as much as possible. Mm -hmm. yes. And that ends my presentation, and I welcome any questions you have. Further questions or comments? Well, I'm, I'm kind of new to this, so I, I just have a really kind of very basic basic question. Um, so, you know, we have our new, own utilities here, unlike a lot of other cities. And so um, I'm, I'm just trying to think of, like, the pros and cons, right? So um, I think I heard that we have slightly, well, we have our electricity is 35 percent below which is good right but our water is higher i'm not sure how high right so i, I guess my, my my question is is you know by having our own utilities you would think there should be some sort of net benefit to palo alto right theoretically right because there's a lot of capital tied up into this which theoretically we could sell off to the sap g e and use the capital for other purposes so theoretically there should be a uh we should see um compared to Surrounding or to P to PG&E customers, you would think that we would we should see 
a net benefit to us. And, I, and I, it's uh, right because I don't know what the water is right now. I don't know if it is a net benefit or not. But we should, right? I mean, theoretically, because we're we have this capital tied up in this asset, right? Which theoretically could have we could sell off to someone else theoretically. And so, um, net net, if we look at everything, do we have lower rates overall compared to PG&E customers? Net overall bill, yes, we are lower of, uh, or not. If, if not lower, we're on par with surrounding well, agencies. Well, that's on par is not good enough because we have all this capital tied up in our in our, our own utilities, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. so. But other agencies are also in the same boat that we are in that you know they have their they have their own water, they have their own wastewater. They some places even have their own. No, I'm just looking from a pure financial <coughs> argument, right? So, for a pure financial argument, um, it's kind of like renting a house versus buying a house, right? Um, so if I buy a house, right, put all this capital into buying a house, my, um, like, theoretically, you should, you should, because you own it, you have all the capital tied into it, it should be cheaper, like, per month, because you have all this capital tied up into owning this house, right, versus renting, right, you're paying the month, the, the, you're, you're renting the service, right, so you're paying money, you, you, you should directly be paying more money in because you don't have all that capital tied up, right, otherwise, why own, right? Why not just well, rent? Ultimately, I would argue that the decisions perhaps historically have been made more on a local control argument than necessarily a financial one. But even if it were simply financial, uh, the benefit that Palo Alto um, ratepayers see is the absence of the profit margin in effect for, say, a company like pg &E. We do have uh, a well, number actually, of factors. On, I would disagree with you on that, right? Because in, in, in the end, it doesn't matter to the customer, right? It matters how much you pay, whether they make a profit or not. If pg e could do it cheaper than we could do it and make a profit, hey, more power to them, right? In the end, what matters is we have a bunch of capital tied up into our own utilities, and if we're not seeing lower rates net overall compared to, let's say, pg e customer, then what the heck, right? Why, why are we doing this? It depends, and it will depend by utility to utility. I, I would say certainly if electric were our focus of discussion, part of it is where we get our electricity from, and which is part of the reason we're seeing the community choice aggregators uh, expanding throughout other cities that don't run their own utility, just as one example. But there are a number of factors, not the least of which is, as you just pointed out, the value of the assets, but we don't invest in the system so that we could sell it out. That, that's not the motivation for No, no I guess I'm just talking about it just from a pure financial point of view, right? Like, we have, I imagine, a ton of money tied up in the utilities right now. Um, I, have, I can't even imagine how much, but it's got to be a lot. Hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe more, maybe a billion, I don't know, some, some large number. And um, you would think, because we are an owner of this utility, we should have inherently lower rates because of the fact that we're not making a profit off ourselves, right? And, and, so, and, so, like, and so if we don't have a lower overall rate, then something is not making sense. I think you got to look, I, I don't think you can look at it only financially because I think reliability is a big factor for the community as I well. I agree. So if we have better reliability, <laughs> lower rates, or a combination of the two, that's great. I agree. But yeah. Do we have better reliability? Is that true? We do not have brownouts. Yes, and that's a function of local control. I mean, <laughs> the, I mean, Dean could probably do a much better job than I can. For example, one of the things that I know that we do much more proactively than PG&E is the trimming of trees on, on, uh, by uh, power lines, for example, which that decreases the number of outages uh, tremendously. It, by having your own crews, you, you dictate you know, your response time. Um, <clears throat> and you have, uh, back to Ed's point, control of what kind of uh, commodity you're buying, whether it's green or otherwise. So I think that there's there's a multitude of areas for you to consider. Yeah, so I think it, if the level of service is higher and or the rates are lower, I agree with you on that, right? Yeah. But I, I just don't know. I mean, are, is, is our level yeah. of service higher and is our rates lower? If it is, great, right? So I think when we come back, in a couple of months, you'll see that comparison. So we'll we can pick up that discussion because you'll be able to see the residential, the commercial, and how it compares to the surrounding communities. Um, <clears throat> it, it's it's a subject that comes up, I would say, every ten years, <laughs> whether we should be in this business or not. 
it, it, it hasn't come up in a while at, a, at the council level. Um, but but it's definitely something that that comes up every so often. Let me, let me try. Okay. Hmm. You understand the question. Yeah. You understand the question he's asking, and he hasn't asked about a couple of the other factors, such as transfer to the general funds and so right. forth, exactly. right? But the question that he's asking is: there an? I mean, it's a very pick your adjective for it kind of question, okay? But is there an answer to it? Is there a known answer to it? Same financial benefits to the city. Yeah. Um, is it is, is it a, is is it a, is it a, you know are we better off? Yeah. Um, you know, I haven't looked at it um, in, in quite some time. I mean, it has been a while since we looked at it in, at that level because we were tasked a few years back, of gosh, to 10, 12 years ago, to look at what we thought was the potential value if we were to. Really? Okay. Sell the asset. I hadn't heard, heard that. Okay. And you know, and it it took quite some time to to put that together. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, the, they started adding all the non-financial factors, and, and they decided, well, it makes you know sense as a whole to keep it. So I, I don't have anything concrete to be able to answer your question uh, tonight. Well, let me try another inflammatory one here. Um, if you know off the top of the head, I mean, we'll, we'll we'll see it in the budget budget hearings anyway, but. What percent of the total expenses are 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 uh, uh, headcount costs? Uh, headcount personnel yeah. costs. Personnel costs. Do you know the number? Yeah, it's, it, it sets it sets right now for about 10 10 percent in the utilities. What's it for PG&E? <laughs> don't know. I don't know. So real quick, in regards to our overall bill, so we do compare it in our strategic plan, what are the measures we have, and our bill is about 8% below our neighboring cities. Okay. Good. Well, that's what I wanted to hear, right? I wanted to hear that we are net positive, right? There's, there's, a, there's a distinct advantage either in level, service, or cost. If it is, then yeah, it probably makes sense, right? But, but if we're like higher than other people and a level service is worse, and we have all the, you know, a billion dollars tied up in our utilities. Something's not penciling out. Cool. Are there any further questions or comments? So we're this is a, uh, you know, sorry. This is a uh, uh, discussion discussion item only. There's not a motion on the t uh, on the, on the, a motion uh, on the agenda. Uh, are there any further questions or comments on item one? Thank you very much, fellas. Thanks for joining us. And uh, this, this, this is very interesting and informative and a spirited discussion here. Right? Um, Don't worry. We'll <laughs> <right>. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, in that case, uh, should we talk about future meetings and agendas? Glad to. Uh, let me ask Kylie to join us at the table as well since we're going to talk to you about the month of May as well. No, hand up. Sorry. Sorry. Thanks, Lost. You guys can take off if you want. Not you. <laughs> so, as you correctly stated, we have not met. Uh, until tonight, but we do have uh, upcoming meetings um, in April. As if you turn to the back of the tonight's agenda, you'll see the calendar for the upcoming meetings. We have April 4th, uh, as you heard from Phil, the refuse rates. We continue with the specific uh, water and wastewater financial plan and rate adjustments. And then on April 18th, we have CDBG. So, <clears throat> well, that's a good question. Um, it is a program that is on the chopping block. It has not been finalized. Um, so it's something that um, we'll make sure that we have as much information for you available as we would know uh, on that evening for the program. It is uh, of concern, obviously, because it does have some great causes that it helps. And you'll hear more about that on the 18th as to what specifically we're considering funding with that federal grant. In addition, that evening, we're going to bring you the gas utility long-term plan. 
and then we start the budget hearings in May. So now you can, I'm going to switch you over to the one that I just gave you, the, green, the one in green heading, uh, which is the uh, budget process proposal that we have in terms of an agenda. Our goal is to have a message from the city manager um, it, giving you the proposed operating budget and capital programs for the organization. Jim will give you an over overview of what's included and the following week we will release the documents to you. Um, there's no meeting the fourth Monday of April, so for that reason we kind of had to chop it up a little bit where we're bringing you the, the message on the 17th and delivering you the documents on the week of the 24th. Um, the first meeting that we will have to discuss items is Tuesday, May 2nd. Um, we are uh, hoping that we could meet at 6 o'clock for these meetings. Uh, given the nature of the discussions where we're trying to close the gap, uh, we, we want to make sure that you have ample of time for us to explain our proposals and for you to have questions or directions for us. And we continue on the 4th, so it's Tuesday, Thursday, <coughs> and we move on to the 9th and 11th. And then what we want to do is have uh, the 11th, excuse me, the 16th, um, be our big night with all the utility discussions. So all of the items that we've been discussing to for, through April and May, we will bring you the whole view of the budget for utilities and capital. So that that's a big night. And then we're hoping that on the 18th we can wrap up all the items. So typically what we have, since uh, there's two uh, new uh, finance committee members, we have a multitude of evening meetings that we present information for you. You may have questions or uh, requests of information that we may not be able to get to you uh, the very next evening. So we try to have all of those items closed and return to you by the wrap up uh, day. Um, our recommendation is that we start at 1 o'clock um, the, in the afternoon on the uh, 18th because uh, what our experience has been that you need, you know, significant time to wrap up all the issues. And since we're recommending some decreases this year um, as well, that you may need that time to deliberate and make your final recommendations to the City Council. And that's our proposed agenda. So, um, uh, let's see. Uh, do we vote on when we start, or how does that work? I mean, like, yes, uh, you can do that. Uh, okay. Committee. Because I, I prefer to keep it at seven. I'm not sure about the rest of you guys, but I, I'd rather keep it at seven as it is versus making it six. So, so, so the. Absent member of the council or the of the committee also has strong preference for seven o'clock. You want to talk about the pros and cons? Maybe for a minute of that. Right. Um, <clears throat> having a, a later start squeezes you and keeps you here later because th these processes take several hours to go through because we have multitude multiple departments coming through, so it's not a quick presentation, if you will. Um, and the thinking is you're going to be here Monday nights late. We're trying to give you a earlier exit on Tuesdays if possible. Yeah, but I mean, also, you know, um, I'm doing other things during the day, so <laughs> I think as other people are. So um, I would also note that uh, certainly helps staff to have the meetings earlier. Yeah. So. I would just note that for the committee's information. I mean, seven is easier for me coming back from the city where I work. Um, I can do six, but seven, like Greg, is easier for me. Um, only other one I'm noticing this little odd, the 16th of May is the Tall Tree Awards. Mm -hmm. I know it's a separate thing, but I assume some of us will be there. Mm -hmm. 
Also, I think if you're going to do a like all day meeting, I'd rather see it like on a Saturday or a Sunday or something like that versus a Thursday or work day. Uh, because that's a that's a pretty big burden there. So just Kylie, I'm the budget director. One thing to note on the wrap up, that is something that's an all citywide thing. So every department has representation there. So it's all directors typically and all um, departmental um, budget staff, financial staff as well. So it's a, a pretty significant um, staffing component that would be at this attending this meeting. Yeah, my recollection of that one is you get a very large number of city staff there and people rotate in and spend a couple hours there and then rotate out to whatever else they're doing and so forth. Let me ask, as, as we discuss this, let me, let me throw another iron into this fire, which is uh, does anybody have a conflict with any of these dates that they can't be here on that day? So the only one that might be hard is the Tall Tree Awards, the 16th of May. Other, otherwise, I'm good. I don't know what time that dinner starts, actually. So I have a standing that goes to uh, yeah. the afternoon standing range right now. The afternoon that goes to uh, 6 30 every, every Tuesday. So I'm in between that. Um, so I'm going to sit down here at 7 o'clock, but at 6 o'clock I will do the meeting. And for me on the 11th, I may be a little bit late. I've got a 5 to 6 p.m. appointment, but I'll come here right after that. Suppose we were to, I, I hesitate to suggest it, but suppose we were to try some split the baby compromise like we start at 6 on Tuesdays and 7 on Thursdays or vice versa or something like that. If that's what the committee mm -hmm. can do, right. we'll work with it. Um, yeah, and then to, because uh, another point that we probably need to help you with, um, past practice has been that if a particular council member has a conflict <clears throat> in an evening, um, as long as there was a quorum, we've continued to hold the meeting with the understanding that we're going to make every effort for all of four of you to be available for the last wrap-up meeting. That's a good clarification, is that in the past we've found it tractable if we have four members at most of the meetings. Yes. The, the risk is that if we ever have two absent, then we can't hold a meeting. That's correct. And then we're all there on the 18th, that whole day thing. Okay. As long as you feed us. <laughs> <laughs> we, we will provide food and drinks and snacks so that we're actually... the. Wonderful city clerk staff, that's all that. So, Council Member Tanaka will not be in town on the 11th of May. And I'll be a little late that day, but maybe that's a good one to go to 7. So maybe that's a good one to yeah. go to 7. Although, I mean, on the 11th, if, if I'm traveling, I should make it at 6 o'clock. Because I'm not going to be here. Well, because oh, Adrian good. can't be oh. here. I can be, I can be here, like, at 6.30. I mean, I, I just... I'm going to suggest... I'm going to suggest 7, because if you're 10 minutes late at 6.30, then we're going to be sitting here for 10 minutes, right? So, so, so I'm going to suggest we just shoot for 7. So... With an 18th, I'm going to reschedule a ton of meetings on the 18th. So I'd much rather have that on Saturday. And also, the public event, which I think is important, too. Right? A lot of the public's working, so... I think it's a tough, a tough thing to haul... 30 or 40 people from city staff in on a, on a weekend for this. I mean, I, if I had to choose, that's a, that's a tricky one. But I think, you know, from a staff standpoint, a couple dozen uh, anyway. at the risk of speaking for staff, that we'd be happy to do it if it drew a lot of public participation. Yeah. This typically does not. This typically does not draw much public. Bob Moss can come any day. <laughs> Her Borak, right? Her there. Borak, right? Um, the only other alternative, in order for us to meet the budget 
packet because we, we have to turn around and then put it together for council with your recommendation would be that Monday but you would have council so you would be subject to yeah. a earlier starting time and a hard stop because of your council meeting yeah I mean the alternative is you could split it over multiple days and do a Wednesday evening and yeah, a Friday evening or something like that too yeah, Friday evening is that's why I'd rather see that instead of just like blot my whole Thursday. Friday evenings aren't great for me in general. I mean, I can do. For I know. The, the, the other challenge we have it's it's a, a dark Friday for some of the staff because we alternate the. Right. Some of the staff are off on one Friday, some on another. What about Wednesday the 17th? I can't do this if one stays. Okay. can't get it done the day after. Yeah. So it would have to probably be Monday then. The 15th? I'm um, sorry. Monday the 20 22nd. 22nd. Is there a council meeting on Monday the 22nd? There is yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That that would be the challenge. You would like last year. Yeah, we started about ten or eleven o'clock in the morning, and four o'clock we had a hard stop, and you we were that's barely able to make it. That's right. But I mean, then you have the same daytime issue of people of, of committee availability. I assume on Monday all day versus Thursday all day. I'd rather not do all day. I'd rather just split yeah. across in the evenings, right? But he's saying, but they're they're a a. A simple solution to that one hasn't presented itself because Monday night's a council meeting. Yeah, the, the, our experience has been that you, in the evening you won't finish. <laughs> could we not, instead of like all day, could we not like split it over multiple yeah, day, multiple evenings? Day. So we would have to do 18 and the only other other day is the 22nd, but then it's a council meeting. You need to. And so you need to start it at 3 in the afternoon or 2 you in the afternoon. You may not finish. Or something like that. But if you don't finish, then, yeah. of course, you may not finish on Thursday, Thursday the 18th as well. Okay. Well, I'm going to suggest that Thursday the 4th, and Thursday the 11th start at 7 p.m. Can we do that? Yes. Yep. From the staff perspective. That's all from the, from the staff perspective. I appreciate staff's forbearance in this. Fourth one for update. Sorry? Fourth one state. Seven, the fourth, and the, and the seventh we start at seven. And the 11th. I'm sorry, the 11th, right. That solves Adrian's problem. You're still gone on the 11th, but Adrian can make it on 7 on the, on the 11th. Nothing doesn't matter. Yeah. And I assume the 7, 7 o'clock on the 4th is better for you than 6. Sure. Okay. And then we still have the issue of uh, how we wrap, how we do the wrap-up. And the available options. So, wait, what, what the 16th? Is that 7? 16th? Yeah, Tuesday. Uh, that's uh, I think we said six. I think we. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, sugge I'm suggesting we do Tuesdays at six and Thursdays at seven. Unless you'd rather do Tuesday the sixteenth at seven and no, some other day the six. <laughs> What's on the? On Tuesday the 16th, we have utilities, utilities. and uh, the capital. So that's a big. Is that going to go late? That's going to yes. go late. Especially the capital. Yep. Because you're going to want to know what all the changes, the so, cost increases. So all the I programs. remember there was one meeting last year where it was going to go way late and we had to start at 6 and Karen couldn't make it till 7. And we sort of engineered the agenda so that it was the first same, hour was it was that same agenda yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we started with yeah. utilities because she didn't want to miss the CIP right and so we, we did some of the more procedural stuff right. early 
Is there a chance we could do something like that on the Sure. So sure. Uh, that's okay. currently how the schedule is proposed on that okay. evening. Is utilities would go until about seven seven thirty, yeah. um, and then we would switch to the general CIP, um, and then switch back to um, utility rates. Now, right. But then you would have to be there at six, because on the on the sixteenth. Well, actually, I mean, we'd have to make sure we had at least three people. If you have three, then Councilmember Tanaka could come in a little later. Come in late if we had three. So we have a cage fight between two council members as to. <laughs> Sorry. Karen also wants seven, right? Yeah, she also wants seven. She, yeah. Well, she wants seven in general. Yeah, so we'll do that, right? That's at least half. I think Adrian would prefer seven, probably. It'd be a little bit easier, but I, I can't do six. So. Right. So there'll be like three it's, people. It's the sheriff's claim, right? Three people prefer right. seven, right? Yeah. Well, we could put it to. I guess we could put it to a vote, huh? The question is, do you want to do you want to haul staff in here? So the problem with the the problem with the 16th is, if you start at seven, it's going to go till one o'clock in the morning or something like that. So if we do seven on the 16th, we just do six. If that's the big one. That is the big one. That yeah, that's that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Right. So if we so if we did, I mean, that's the question on the on the 16th. So. We're doing seven on the on the eleventh. Mm -hmm. We're doing seven on the fourth. Right. Right. And at the moment we're doing six on the second and the sixteenth and the ninth. Wait, when is Tulchi? Sixteenth. What time is it? I don't know. It's probably seven. It's probably seven. It's probably so I may put this with this one. Yeah, I think it is what it is. I think yeah, I think. Um, too bad I was actually thinking about going this year because they're giving one to winter. But, yeah. Okay. Um, um, okay. So I don't see how I don't see how we do this. I mean, the sixteenth is a big. Which which ones these are shortest? I'm sorry, could you repeat that which, question? Which, which agendas, I should have asked this earlier, which agendas here are shortest? Sure. Um, which are the short nights? Actually, Everything's what? Everything's relative. <laughs> Fair yeah. enough. Uh, the evening that's actually the shortest, shortest I'm sorry, is the 11th. Yeah. Um, and the, however, there's a hold on there because typically things spill over uh, um, from longer evenings. So, yep. for example, the 4th is a really jammed um, schedule. On Thursday, yes. and so to the extent things need to spill over from that, um, it'll probably fall over onto the 11th. So there's a little Great. bit of a buffer so that the whole process doesn't fall completely out of whack. <laughs> Great. So the fourth, uh, the fourth is okay. What about the second? The second is, um, I would say, a, a pretty standard evening. Um, okay. And what I was actually thinking is, is given the seven o'clock start time on the fourth. I may try and bump a few things up to the second okay, to, yeah. again, spread That's it a, a little ahead and a little behind. Right. I think <clears throat> there's an interest on several of you to discuss pension, and that's probably a, a, which, that's which the night that we, the second of <coughs> May, the second. that's when we would discuss pension. Okay. And then the ninth is, I would say, average, but you guys are probably going to want to talk about parking on that evening. And it's also all of our public safety, so police as well as fire. Well, I think we should stick with 7 o'clock on the 4th and the 11th. Sorry, and the 16th. No, on the 4th and the 11th, mm -hmm. right? And 6 o'clock on certainly the 16th. And then we could argue about Tuesday the 9th. Okay. 
but can't you make it six though? Well, we'll have to check on that one too. Right. So all this is subject to subject to clear object this clear clearing clearing with clearing with uh, Councilmember Holman. I, I can't so how, how big how big an obstacle how big how big a how big a, a difficulty is it if Tuesday the night starts at seven? Well, that's one of the departments where you're going to see the biggest cuts. Yep. And then parking seems to be subject to sorry to department with the biggest cuts. And then um, a lot of issues with planning usually okay. beyond parking. Well, <coughs> you guys are willing to stay till strange hours of the night? I'd rather the, do that than you rather do that than six. start at six. Yeah, I'd rather do that. Why don't we do that? So seven on the right. And it'll give us an incentive to be terse. <laughs> <laughs> So now we're talking about seven on the fourth, the ninth, and the eleventh, and six on the other notes. And we gotta <coughs> review the sixteenth uh, tall tree. The sixteenth, uh, you know, I. It's, okay. it's worth doing. I, yeah, I think. I mean. It, this this is our job, and yeah. the other thing is, it's sort of our job, or, but it's <laughs> not the, so not the same way, right? So, right, and then we have an issue with uh, the the Thursday eighteenth issue. So I will uh, consult with the absent member of our group on this and see where she stands on all this kind of stuff. When is our next meeting? Our next meeting is the fourth of April, and that is. Uh, two weeks from today, or is it one week? No, it's two weeks. Two weeks. It's two weeks. Okay. I am loath to let this go two weeks without a resolution. So let me consult with Karen and get back to it with Lalo, right? Thank you. What are our other options? Suppose on the 18th. The 18th is the stickiest one. So we have one option which is proceed and hope we can get three people at it, okay? What are, what are, that's, that's, that's option A. What's option B? Uh, continue, start on the 18th and continue on the 22nd. The 22nd, and what time on the 22nd? It would have to be before your council meeting. Right. So, we would have Two to- Two o'clock in the afternoon or something yeah. like that? That we got, you know, I'm not sure if Jessica has this yeah, current starting exactly. time. So, so, for the so what, what's what's the current starting time on the 18th? Well, we recommend two o'clock, one o'clock is what we said, but you know, sounds like that's an issue. Um, well, 18th. Yeah, right we're, now we're, we're, we're start time for the council meeting on the 22nd. It's going to be study sessions mainly that day. Okay. And huh. The parks master plans. Yes. And if four of us are gone, is there still a quorum on council? Yes. But some of you guys will some of you guys will be tied up. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm sorry. I'm exploring the idea that we could be still we could be still doing the finance oh, committee right. here while they're doing council in there. Right? That would be a first. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean maybe simultaneous with the council. Why don't you just move to Saturday? I mean make it more public, more available so the public can share. Option C is uh, Saturday. I'm I'm not I'm not supportive of option C. Right. Too many too many other people. Right. I'd, I'd much rather we found a way to do this within the constraints of staff. staff yeah. So I can do the 18th of the day. Yep. Okay. So the. But, but so option B, option B is option B is option B is the eve of evening of the 18th plus some amount of time. The council meeting starts at six plus three p.m. on the 22nd. Well, how about move it to another evening? And Friday. Well, okay. So that's a possibility. What about the what about the hey hey Lala? I'm, I'm what sorry. about the evening of Friday the 19th? Oh, that's a that's an off day. That's an off day. Yeah, it's a dark day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do like Friday 
the 12th. What about Wednesday the 17th? I can't, do can't do that. Wednesdays. So you're saying Friday the 12th? Yeah, or the 26th. How about the 26th? So, oh, from a timing perspective, yeah. um, the adopted budget packet actually has to go out two weeks after the um, 18th. Um, so to pull all of your guys' changes together yep. and pull together um, probably one of your largest CMRs in that amount of time, two weeks is as short as we can get, and that's working seven days a week. Tuesday the 23rd. Um, well, what I was going to suggest is if you guys are okay, that's for us to get the packet out two weeks in advance of council. Mm -hmm. If you guys are okay with it, then we could do the adopted in late packet. So that right. means that you would have all the knowledge and your, and your colleagues would only have a shorter amount of time to read you all the... <laughs> 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 well, what's, what's council going to do? Is council going to vote on it? Correct. Right. So and how long would council have? Oh, council would have it for five days instead of... Uh, the 11 days. The 11 mm -hmm. days. Okay. Let me yeah. have a word with the mayor on that one. <laughs> so just, okay. I know not ideal, but, but just. But so, but so if, if that were acceptable, then would uh, an evening after the 22nd be? Correct. As long as it's in the first half of that week. And uh, <laughs> as long as it's in the first 23rd. half of that week. <laughs> yeah, 23rd, 24th. 23rd, 24th. And do we, have, do we happen to have a finance meet committee meeting on the 23rd? <laughs> uh, no. And I partially say that because that is Memorial Day weekend, so I also think you're going to start losing people to um, <laughs> taking the longer weekend. Okay. Yeah, we won't lose this group. No, right. of course not. And you won't lose us. So <laughs> the evening the 18th and the evening of the 23rd. Do you have the evening of the 23rd? Uh, I right. love I've got Parks and Rec, but I can skip it. Okay. The evening the Parks Commission meets that night 23rd. 23rd. Yeah. The evening of the 23rd, such that uh, that the, bu the, uh, the budget in late packet. In the late packet. Uh, okay. It's a, so you would work on the starting times for both of those nights on that option? So we would do the, we would do six or seven on the 18th and the 23rd. Right, both the 18th and the 23rd, and hope we finished it all. Okay. Right, and that would require uh, the budget to go out. Uh, how many days in advance? Mm -hmm. How many? Five days. In five days in advance. Instead of the 11. So it would just be the adopted budget CMR. Um, obviously, they do have access to the proposed books, but any changes that occur during these hearings, it's pulling all of that together, summarizing it, and redoing. Got it. Yeah, because uh, so my guess is that actually the council will probably be okay with that. Yeah, because what we try to do is also put the minutes in there because they want to read what you deliberated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because the because the whole council gets the books, right? So it's all the changes. Correct. Right. Okay. All right. So I'll have a word with Karen and Greg. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, this is uh, for the complexity of this. You guys, okay with that? Okay. Just Once we finalize this, the staff could send out an update. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. And with that. If there are no other, other, other items, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.